Amen. Thank you, South Point Church. You guys can be seated. It's good to see you guys today. Nice full room. I hope you guys are all having a great Sunday and enjoying the weather. It's been a little bit cooler this morning, uh, which has been really nice. I must say up front that I feel a little bit different uh, because I'm missing my, my rib. I'm missing my, my second part. Casey's unable to be here today because Benjamin is sick, so she came in to say hi, and then she's leaving, which also means, Brad is going to make sure our TV's on, which also means that I can say anything that I want to say this morning because there's no, there's no eyeball. I, I can't feel the heat from the eyeball that tells me what to say or what not to say. So, hey, you guys sounded amazing. You know, as, as I was in the back listening to you guys worship, it just sounded incredible. So I want you guys to know that, that for me, sometimes I get to be out here and sometimes I'm not. But when I'm not out here and I can hear you, it's just, yeah, it's just really, really um, amazing and encouraging. So I kind of had a a personal moment backstage because of you guys. So like Colette said, we're talking about peace. So over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about where does our peace come from and talking about this, this restless feeling that many of us find ourselves in. And it, it's, it, I felt like this was a thing that we could all, especially now, you know, wrap our heads around. Is this idea that where does our peace f- come from and, and do we need more peace? You know, is, are we getting the right source of peace? Are we filling our, our peace bucket with the right thing? And so before we get into, into the details of this, I think the, the first thing I want to do is I want to talk about toast. So toast, they're going to put a picture up for you here. Maybe, Fritz, you could just bring me down a little bit on my audio. So, what's the deal with toast? I'm a person that loves toast, and I love sandwiches. But the problem with toast is this, is when you make toast, you put it in the toaster, you pull it out of the toaster, okay? You put it on the plate. Some of you are wondering, where is he going with this? But you'll you'll understand, you'll understand. The problem with toast is actually the crumbs, so when you, when you, know, you butter your bread on Friday night, we had a bunch of kids here that they were making sandwiches for ladles of love. And I walked in and Trudy, who's over family ministries, her hands were covered in peanut butter. And she said, Chris, do you want a hug? And I said, Trudy, do you want a job? And so she, she, back, she backed away. Like, that's not me. I don't like that. I don't like the sticky. I don't, I don't like that stuff. And toast causes me stress. So in the mornings when I get up, if I walk into the kitchen and Casey's making sandwiches and toast and Leaf is making toast and everyone's making toast, I, all I can think about are the crumbs that are going to be around the toaster. We even have a tray that goes under our toaster that my lovely wife bought for me because I am a bit crazy and she at least the, the crumbs can be contained into the tray. But I, I get a, a real almost PTSD reaction when I walk in and the whole family's making toast, especially Benjamin. Benjamin's got this thing. He's, he's got the, the, he doesn't actually take bites of bread. He's just a grinder. He's a tree chipper. So he just starts grinding and the, the toast goes in and some of it goes into his mouth, but most of it goes underneath his table. And for me, that's a really stressful thing. That, I, I see that, and usually I just leave. I go sit in my office, and I wait for everyone to leave, and then I come back, and I you know, clean up everyone's toast crumbs. But toast and crumbs really stress me out. Another thing that stresses me out, and I hate that Casey's not here because she would really laugh at this, is has anyone ever had to try and clean up wet coffee grounds? Oh, man, I'm in good company. I'm in good, good company. We have an insulated press that my mom brought from the States for us years and years ago. And with this thing, you know, I put the coffee grounds in it and I fill it up with water. And, and it's, so, it's such a tight seal that about two out of every ten times that I go to plunge, it, it squirts coffee grounds, you know, out the, out the spout. And it's, it's nearly impossible to clean up coffee grounds. You can't take a serviette and wipe it up, and so then you've got a dustpan and a broom, and then I'm having to clean the dustpan, I'm having to clean the broom, then you got to put the broom out to dry, because otherwise, when I get the broom later to clean up the toast crumbs, I'm just smearing toast across the floor, and it's, it's, a, it, it's a cycle. So for, for me, to, toast would be better without crumbs, and coffee would be less stressful when I spilled it if, if it wasn't so hard to clean up wet coffee grounds. And see, to tie this into peace, 
the way that we find peace is kind of a little bit like this. This actually describes it really, really well. See, I, I, I'll give you a definition of, of peace. The definition of peace is this. Remove the crumbs and there is peace. Okay, so that's funny. It, it's funny to think about it like that. And, and that's true for me. If I were to remove the crumbs from toast, I would have peace. I would walk into the kitchen and see the whole family making toast. At one point, I was like, why does everyone eat toast with every single meal? And I would walk in and I would find peace because I've removed the crumbs. Now, our, our de definition of actual peace in our life, the definition that we ascribe to, is, is the exact same thing. See, we, we say that, that peace is the removal of things that cause us fear and stress. So, just like I want toast crumbs to be removed so that there's no stress with making toast, we look at our lives and we say, if, if I could just get rid of things that cause me fear and cause me stress then I would have peace. Am I, am I talking to anybody here? This is something that, that we deal with. We, we have things in life that we think, if this just wasn't here, then my life would be so much more peaceful. My life would be so much more calm. My life would be so much more... Um, I, I, I could deal with it a little bit better because all these things that are bad or that are wrong or that, that cause me stress would be gone. In fact, I'm going to work to shape my entire life around removing all the things in my life that cause me stress so that I can just be a peaceful person. Now, this is the definition I want you to hold on to because we're going to come back to this towards the end of the message today. But I, I want us all to identify with this because I believe more than we know, that, that this, more than we wish that our definition of peace was different, this is our actual definition of peace. And what I hope to show you by the end of this message is that we've been looking for peace in all the wrong places. But this is, this is where we define peace in our lives. And so I'm actually going to give you three sources where we, where we find peace. So there's going to be or three sources where we find stress. There's, there's generally, there's more of them, but there's generally about three buckets that we tend to put stress in. Into, or we tend to find as a source of stress. And the first one is a place. So places are something that we associate with a lack of peace. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. When Casey and I got married, we lived in White River, White River up in Pumalunga. Anyone in here from, from White River? Obviously not. I was hoping that one person would say, woo, you know, in the background. But okay, so we lived in, in White River right outside of Nelspruit. And we had this beautiful house. We had three hectares. We had mango trees. And we had all kinds of fruit trees and, and lychee trees. And there were monkeys that came through the, the backyard uh, every day at sunset. And we would sit on the porch. And it was this, this huge house in White River. And then we had an apartment off to the side with a, this amazing young man that was living there. And it was just this incredible experience with five bedrooms, a two-car garage. I mean, it was... It was an awesome, awesome piece of property. And the whole thing, all the acreage, all the fruit trees, all of everything, it was cheap. It was like 10,000 rand a month. Now, for you Cape Town people, you know, you're scoffing at that because you, you, here we can't rent anything for that. Whereas in White River, you can't find anything more expensive than that to rent. And when, when, when Casey saw this house, we spent six months driving by this house, and every time we would drive by it to go to the gym or to go somewhere, we would pray, and we would say, God, we believe that you've delivered this house for us, and so this is going to be a house that we're going to move into, and at the time, there was a family living there who had no intentions on moving, and so every morning when I would go to the gym, I would pray, and I would drive by the house, I would pray, I would say, God, you know, my wife's got this crazy idea from you that this is going to be a house that we live in, so... You know, here I am being obedient, and I'm praying for it and praying about it. And then, lo and behold, a couple months later, we actually got a call from the people that, that own the house, and they asked us if we wanted to rent the house. And it was like, wow, prayer, prayer really works there. But what happened after we moved into the house is this place became an extreme source of stress for me, because across the valley, there was, there was a bar, and this bar, every Wednesday night, every Thursday night, and every Friday and Saturday night, they played a lot of music. They played a lot of loud music. And in our house, the, the bass and the music just reverberated through the walls. 
And what ended up happening is this place became a huge source of stress for me. Because here I was saying, but God, you called us to this place. And also, God, this place is trying to kill me. This place is, is, is literally causing me stress. It's, I mean, I was walking around just miserable in that house. And you know what we did? We prayed and we prayed and we prayed about that bar. And guess what? That bar was actually closed down because they were selling alcohol to, to minors. I'll never forget the morning that I drove out and I saw the gates locked and I, I stopped and I asked somebody and they said, no, they got busted. The place is closed down. And I thought, this is absolutely incredible. But then what happened after that is the people that own the bar also lived in the same neighborhood as us, and they just moved the bar to their house. So this place became an extreme source of stress for me. So maybe for you, it's your home, or maybe for you, it's your work, or maybe for you, it's a place that, that you had a, a tragic thing happen, like maybe a car accident or something like that. But there are places that we think of, if I remove this place, then I will not have the same stress. And when we moved from that house in White River and moved to Cape Town, I thought, okay, all of that stress is now gone because it's going to be different here in, in Cape Town. And, it, and it's not, and it wasn't. And I've had to learn to readjust to that. But places are huge sources of stress for us. The, the next one, the next bucket I want to talk about are problems. Problems are big sources of stress for us. Now, I don't want to make light of this one. I, I don't want to tell you know, jokes, because this is, a, this is a very serious thing. This is cancer. This is a death in the family. This is, um, you know, two flat tires on your car, which may not seem like a big idea or seem like a big deal when you're thinking about, you know, comparing it to things like cancer. But you know what? There's a lot of people that have one car, and if they can't get to work, then they don't make money. And so when they come outside and there's, there's flat tires, it's like, you know, how am I going to take care of my family? You know, these problems that we encounter, the problems that we encounter, all, you know, throughout our life and throughout our days, these are huge sources of stress for us. You know, Casey and I, another story about us is when, when we got married, we took our honeymoon in Lesotho, and we went to Lesotho and back, and we had this great honeymoon, and then we went to America and saw our family, I actually met Casey's family for the first time ever, it was after we got married, but because they were in America and we were here, I got to go over there and meet them. And then we came back to South Africa. And then we took a trip to Swaziland. And we were in Swaziland. And as we were coming back into South Africa, the Border Patrol says, Chris, this passport of Casey's, is, it's not valid. And I'm like, well, okay, you know, this has got to be a mistake. We've traveled on this passport. We've traveled on this visa. We've been all over the world with it. I know that it works. I know that it's real. I mean, you can look at it. It's a real sticker in the book. And they said, no, nah, I'm sorry. It's not in our system. This is a fake visa. And so we had to leave that border. And we had to go through the mountains of Swaziland to another little border post in a little part of Swaziland called Belimbu. And there, the same system was set up where they would scan it, and they would scan the visa, and they would see that it was fraudulent, and we would get turned away, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And that problem was causing extreme, extreme stress. And we get to the border post, and we pull in, and there were some guys riding mountain bikes up the mountain. And because they were riding these mountain bikes up the mountain, the security guards at Border Patrol, they weren't paying attention to us. And they just scanned Casey's visa, stamped it, and off we went. Now, we would spend the next six years fighting home affairs. Six years taking home affairs to court so that we could get Casey's visa cleared because it was a real visa. And this year, finally, six years later, we, we won that case. And Casey's visa was cleared, and now everything is bright as rain. But for six years, I thought to myself, if this problem would just go away, I would not be stressed. If the problem of Casey's visa... Being Ill illegal would go away. I would not be stressed. If, if Casey's visa would come right, then we would not be, have to be here. It was, Casey hasn't seen her mom in six years. You know, we, she hasn't been able to go back to America in like six years because of this. We spent a lot of nights saying, God, if you just solve this problem, then our source of stress will go away. Now, what problems do you have in your life that you could reflect on 
I know that we all have something where we think if this one thing was fixed or gone or different, then my stress would go away. And that makes sense. It makes total sense. Now, the, the last bucket that I want to talk about is people or, or a person. People, hey, you know, people, huge source of stress. Um, we all know that. If you're sitting next to your source of stress, please don't elbow them or nudge them. Just keep that private, you know. So I, I, don't, know, I don't know who this is for you, but is it a boss? Is it a mom or a mother-in-law or a father-in-law? Is it family? Is it a coworker? Is it a bully where you are? What, what is, is there a person that's in your life that causes you an enormous amount of stress? Is there, is there a person in your life that maybe has hurt you or, or inflicted something on you? Or actually, better yet, when you walk into a room and you see that someone is there and, and you immediately feel like stress or a little bit more anxiety, then that person is causing you stress. Or another way to think about it is if you go to work or you get home from school or you get home from work or you come to somebody else's house and someone that would normally be there is not there, and you feel a sense of peace and relaxation, then that tells you that that person that isn't there is a huge source of stress in your life. See, the, these three buckets are so important to us, and they catch many things in our life, the places, the problems, and the people that actually cause us a lot of stress. They keep us from finding peace. Now, what I want you to know, remember the original definition that we talked about with peace is it's the removal of things that cause us fear or things that cause us stress. Now what I want to do is I want to show you that there's a problem with our definition of peace. There's a huge problem with our definition of peace. And, and here's why it is. Because when, when you solve one problem, it, another problem comes right after it, right? Right? So you, 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 you find yourself, you know what, if this problem would just be solved, if this problem would just be taken care of, then all of a sudden I, I won't have any stress or any, any stress in my life. I'll be able to have peace in my life. But then guess what comes? Another problem in life comes, and then we get stressed again. When it comes to people, if somebody that's toxic in your life gets removed from your life and you think, oh man, I finally have broken free from this relationship, I finally have gotten some distance and some space from this relationship, then, then, then now I'm going to have peace. When I go home, I'm going to have peace. But you know what happens is later you meet another person, and that other person that you meet causes you the same amount of stress. It causes you the same amount of pain. It takes your peace. It, it's the same with places, with me thinking if I move from one house to another house, then all of a sudden I'm not going to have any stress in my life. And in fact, I've I've got a, a thing here for you to read. If our definition of peace is the removal of what causes us stress, so our definition is we remove the things that cause stress, yet we always find new ways to be stressed, then is peace even possible? So is it possible to find peace by our definition of peace, removing things? Because when we remove something, another thing comes, and another thing comes, and another thing, it just keeps coming. So I, I'm here to give you maybe some bad news. I, I wish that I could tell you that, that there is a way for you to find peace based on that definition. But there's not. The answer to this, unequivocally, is no. The only way that you could, that you could find a way to have peace in your life by removing things. And a lot of people try and do this. They say, this person hurt me, so I'm going to remove that. And then they say, okay, this person hurt me again, so now I'm going to remove that. Okay, I've been hurt by two men, so now I'm no longer going to allow men into my relationship. Or I've been hurt by, by two, uh, you know, two different bosses, so now I'm going to go and I'm going to work for my own, or I'm going to stop trusting people that I work with. Or if we say, you know, I keep getting hurt in this living situation, I'm no longer going to do that. And what you do is you keep removing things from your life. You take something out, you take something out, you take something out, you take something out. And then what you end up becoming is you become somebody that's very lonely. You don't have a home, you don't have people in your life, and everything that you do revolves around trying to limit the problems that, that could cause you stress. 
And all you want, I know what you want. All you want is peace. All you want is to wake up in the morning and say, I have peace with today. All you want is the ability at any point in your day, maybe. I mean, how many of us would want this? On our lunch break or sitting in traffic or at home around the dinner table while the kids are throwing toast crumbs everywhere. We just want to take a deep breath and we want to just want to be able to say, ah, I have peace. I can find peace in my life. In the middle of working for bad bosses, in the middle of, of people just causing drama on Facebook in your life, in the middle of family just not treating you right, don't we wish that we could just take a deep breath and say, you know what, I still have peace in my life. And so, this is not possible. You will never have peace if you just have to keep removing things. So, if we want a different outcome, which we want the outcome of peace, then what we have to do is we have to have a different definition. So, if we want a different outcome for our lives, then we've got to have a new definition for peace. So I don't know if anyone out there is content with the amount of peace that they have in their life or the amount of peace that you have access to. But if you're content, you can just shut down or shut off or play Candy Crush on your phone or something. But for everyone else that would like a little bit more peace, that would like a little bit more access to peace in your life, no matter the circumstances, what we have to do is we have to give it a different definition. Because see, your definition is not working. Your definition has not been working for a long time. So what we're going to do is we're going to swap your definition out and we're going to try Jesus' definition. Because Jesus actually, he does give us a definition for peace. He gives a very clear definition for peace. Now this is something that we can overlook in Scripture and we'll get into the Scripture of it. But what I, I need everybody to zero in on this right here before we go on. My desire for you is that today, your takeaway is that you walk out of this room and you can say to yourself, I've got a little bit more of an understanding of how I can have peace in a difficult situation. I, I, I am absolutely dumbfounded that you guys come every single Sunday and you give time out of your week for us. It's incredible. It's incre I mean, I just feel like... All I want to do is honor you. All I want to do is give you something that makes your life better. All I want to do is just love on you. But I'm so thankful that we get the opportunity to do that. So my heart for you is when you walk out of here, you just have a little bit more access to finding peace. And in fact, for some of you, you'll have a breakthrough. And you'll actually be able to access an enormous amount of peace in your life. And so... That's what we're going to do when we go into Jesus' definition of peace. We're not, we're not just talking about what Jesus said about peace because he said it and because it's in the Bible. We're talking about it because it's truth and it's fact and it is the key for you to have peace in your life no matter what circumstance you have going on. This, this definition is what's going to set you free. So, we're going to find this in John. Now, I've got, I've got John... 1317 up here for you because of this. You, you guys can go and, and if you get really eager or maybe you've never read your Bible, you don't know anything, you don't know how to read a Bible, go through here and read John 1317. It's as good a place to start as any. And what John is doing in these chapters, just to give you some context, John is actually recording Jesus' last thoughts or he's recording Jesus' last conversations. And so what Jesus is about to do, Jesus knows that he's about to die. He's about to be arrested. He's about to be put on the cross. He's about to be crucified. And then three days later, he's going to rise up and he's going to interact with the disciples and others. And then after that, he's going to ascend into heaven. And so Jesus knows this is coming. And so he's preparing his disciples for that. He's giving them warning. He's saying things to them to equip them and take care of them. And that's what these chapters are for. It's, it's John recording Jesus lovingly and caringly just equipping the disciples with what they need. And he knows that they're going to need peace. He knows that they're going to come against problems and places and people that are going to try and steal their peace, that are going to cause stress. And Jesus says, I want to make sure you're equipped to deal with all of this. And so we, we find ourselves in John 14. And, and this is a verse here. That I'll unpack it for you guys a little bit. And it starts out in verse 25. It says, 
All this I've spoken while still with you. So because I can't talk to you for an hour, essentially what's happened up to this moment is Jesus has told the disciples what's going to happen. And the reason that he says, I've spoken this while I'm still with you, is because he wants to highlight the fact that, that hey, when I die, you're going to see everything that I've already said is going to come true. It, it's, Jesus is saying, like, hey, I'm not going to leave any room for creativity. I'm calling my shot before it happens, and after it happens, you're going to look back and you're going to say, it's exactly like he said that it was. So that's that. Verse 26, Jesus says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. So let me talk to you a little bit about Advocate and Holy Spirit. This is something a lot of people don't know about. I don't have time to unpack the magnitude of of what the Holy Spirit is for you. But if you look at what Jesus is saying here, Jesus is saying, I'm leaving, but I really, really, really care about you. I really love you. And right now, while I'm here on earth, I can take care of you as my disciples. I can speak to you. I can coach you. I can love on you. I can be with you. You can be in my presence. But Jesus is saying, I'm going to go. And when I go, because I care about you so much, and because I love you so much, and because I want so much for you, and because I know all the things that you're going to encounter in your life, all the problems, all the places, all the people that you're going to be up against, I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you a helper that is especially equipped to talk to you, to draw you near to God, to draw you near to to, to Jesus. This helper, this advocate, it's there for you to remind you of God's love for you. That's why he actually says that this, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, your helper, it's, it's the Spirit of God that wants to help you always know of everything that He has said to them, which is that God loves them, that, that Jesus loves them, that their sins are forgiven, that, that they have freedom in Christ. That it's, it's as we forget that, before we go into, into peace, I, I just want to remind you that when you come across things about the Holy Spirit, and you come across things about an advocate, I want you to know that those are points in the Scripture where Jesus has said, I love you so much, I'm going to give you a helper that will be with you for, the, for all of eternity, that when you accept me as your Lord and Savior, you get this helper, and its sole job is to just draw you close to me and to remind you of how much I love you and to speak to you. And you know what? There's this other cool verse that's in the Bible, where the advocate, the Holy Spirit, actually goes to the throne room of God. So think about heaven, and think about God sitting on a throne. And when we sit and pray, sometimes we know what to pray, sometimes we don't know what to pray. And this helper, this advocate, actually goes to the throne room of God, and it groans on our behalf. How cool is that? That even when we don't know what to pray and what to ask for, that this this thing, this Holy Spirit that God sends for us, groans for you. It cares about you. It loves you. It's put in place for that. So Jesus wants to set that foundation for the disciples. And that is the foundation that we're going to build peace on. So after Jesus has told them about this, he goes on in verse, in, in verse 27. Finally, we get to peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. See, the key for this verse is the statement I've highlighted. I do not give it to you as the world gives. So, what's our definition of peace? Our definition of peace is is we remove things. So Jesus is saying, the peace I give to you, I give to you differently. In fact, the world says peace is the removal of something. Jesus says peace comes... When you add something in. See, that's why he spent time talking about the Holy Spirit and the helper. See, we talk about removing things to get peace. And that's why we'll never find peace. Because we can never remove enough things. But what Jesus is telling us, by giving us this helper, he's saying, I'm going to add something so amazing to your life. And when I add that in... When I add something in, you're going to get peace. And that's why Jesus says in the verse, I'm going to give you peace, but it doesn't come the way that the world gives it. 
So we have to understand that our definition is not the right definition. That there's a better definition of peace. We've been looking for peace in all the wrong places and in all the wrong ways. And we're not punished for that. Instead, we've got a loving Heavenly Father, Jesus, who says, I want you to get this because I care about you. And so I want to show you one more time the difference in the equations. And it says, my, me, minus my problem equals peace. That's what we think. We think if I remove things, then I'll have peace. Now, the, the definition that Jesus has is me plus his presence equals peace. Right? So we're adding something in, and when we add something in, we're, we're getting peace. Man, this means that no matter what problem or place or person you're up against, when you add the presence of Jesus to your life, then you find peace. You know, I know a lot of peace warriors out there. And when I look at your life, I think, how on earth are you doing it every single day? And the key to it is, the secret to it is, is they've just figured out how to add this. So, lasting peace. It's not the removal of stuff. It's the adding of Jesus' presence. Now, I've, I've got a... I've got a, a fun way that I want to explain this to you guys, and it involves this light. We've got a, 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 you guys know, if you know me, I like to use emojis, so I've got a light bulb emoji here that they're going to put on the screen for you. Now, yeah, I'm so excited about this. I just, I just want you guys to know. <laughs> um, have, have you guys ever, so at night, when I wake up, there's several times that this has happened. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I have to go to the bathroom. When I was young, you know, 18 years old, my dad would tell me about all the times he woke up in the middle of the night, went to the bathroom, and I would think, what's wrong with that dude? You know, you just go to bed and you go to sleep and you wake up the next day. Well, now I wake up in the middle of the night, have to go to the bathroom. So I don't know why they built our house the way that they built it, but the closet doors are the exact same texture as the wall that they sit next to, and they're completely flush with each other. Do you know how many times that I have walked face first into the wall next to the closet door. And the reason I do that is because I don't, I, don't, I don't have a light on. Or, if you can't identify with that, how many times have you come around the edge of your bed, and you know the bed has the, little, has the, 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 the foot on the floor? Somebody knows my pain. Somebody already knows. And you walk around, and you know, you're trying to dance between fans and stuff on the floor, and you just you kick that thing, and it hits your pinky toe. And then, then you find yourself at 2 in the morning, doubled over, just calling for just the fire and the glory of Jesus to reign over your house and just consume everything. Guys, that's a painful, painful thing. That's a very painful thing. But... I, I want to I better illustrate peace for you. And so I, I, my, parent, my parents will understand this. Okay, Parents in the room will understand this. If you're not a parent, you'll still be able to track with me on this. But I've got, I've got a, a prop here. Okay, Let me just carefully get this. The band is going to be upset. That's okay. So what I have here... Parents, you know where this is going, don't you? Yeah. So what we have here is, what we have is, is warfare. Warfare that our children take out on us. So now what we have is we have a war zone. When you as a parent... Try to navigate this in the middle of the night. Okay? You know how difficult this is in the dark. The likelihood, the likelihood that you will make it across your bedroom without stepping on something and wishing for death immediately is slim to none. You are going to step on something. So my, my team's going to do something. I want to turn all the lights out in the room. So they're going to they're turn all the lights out. 
I'm even going to, for the illustration of this, I'm going to turn the TV off here. For our online viewers, I just, I want you guys to listen to me and listen to my voice. It's dark. There's no way in the dark that I'm going to make it through this minefield of blocks and toys without stepping on something that's going to hurt my foot. There's no way. No matter how careful I am, I can't do it. No matter how many blocks I try and remove, I'm still going to miss a block. I could crawl on my hands and feet, and I'm still going to miss a block. And then when I get up and I think I've just made it, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to step on the one that was left over. But guess what happens? If I use this magic thing here called a light, now when I get out of bed and I turn a light on, I can see all the blocks. And now, I don't have to be worried about stepping on a block. I don't have to be worried about what my feet are going to encounter. I don't even have to worry about removing blocks because I can see them. See, peace doesn't come because you've removed the blocks on your carpet or you've removed the blocks in your life. Peace comes when you turn on the light, when you add the presence of Jesus to your life. When you add the presence of Jesus, which is light, which illuminates your life with love, it illuminates your day, it illuminates your problems, it illuminates the people around you, it illuminates the places in your life, and it brings those to life in a way that you can see and you can navigate through. And with this light, I can walk through any level of problems in my life. There's not a place, a person, or anything that I can't navigate. See, our definition of peace needs to change. And you guys can bring the house lights back up here. And, and I'll, I'll finish with this before we, before we invite you to worship again. Our definition of peace needs to change. But it's going to change to something that I guarantee you is going to make life easier to navigate. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed and think about all the places and people and things in your life that you have to remove. You don't have to remove anything. Your home life, all those things, you don't have to remove them. All you have to do is add in the presence of Jesus, and you'll navigate those things. We're going to spend the next two weeks talking about how to do that. Now, if you're sitting here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have the band, they're going to come up after I pray. And that's so that you have a moment where you can think about this. And when you do, I want you to think about what it would be like for you to just bring a little bit more Jesus into your life. And you know what's amazing? Let's say you've never prayed. Let's say you don't even know Jesus. You're, you're, you're someone, someone's dragged you here or tricked you into being here with coffee or something, and you're saying, I don't yet know Jesus, or I don't understand this whole Jesus thing. Let me tell you something. The name of Jesus alone is enough. So if you don't know how to pray... If you don't know how to add Jesus' presence into your life so that you can have the things in front of you illuminated, just say one word, Jesus. We teach both our kids that. We taught Leaf at an early age, and we teach Benjamin that now. When you don't know what to do, you just add Jesus to it. So I'm going to pray, and the band's going to take the stage. Lord, thank you so much.